Loud and clear. Can you hear me? Wing yes, Commander, wing Loud commander and clear. Marcus Dimbleby retired. <laughs> uh, uh, no, How are you, my friend? No, no, yeah, he, he, he doesn't look like an old man, you know, but he, he's not an old man. And, hey, looks can be deceiving, eh? No, you're not an old man. <laughs> this man, this man is, he, he worked with the Royal Air Force for over 20 years, right, in Britain, right? And he's a wink, wink, he retired as a commission officer, wing commander, uh, and he's retired. And I'm telling you seriously, uh, this is my brother from another mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. Uh, what I'm going to actually do is try to read your profile, you know, just to put it in context in terms of what I've just said. So, Marcus is a former military red teamer and a fighter controller and retiring from the RAF in 2013. He served tours in the Royal Marines, Royal Navy, and the U.S. Marine Corps, with whom he deployed to Iraq in 2003. He also worked closely with the cabinet office during the 2012 Olympics. After leaving RAF, Marcus moved into business, initially working for global consultancy before moving to lead a lot of business transformation and becoming the head of Agile at Lloyds Bank. Wow. Mm -hmm. As a VP of the Red Team Thinking, he now focuses on enabling organizations and the people within to deal with the complexities of today's world. I don't know if there's more complexities than <laughs> what we find ourselves in, but ex exceptional profile. Personally, I can't wait to hear what you have to say, how you transition from um, all those great military staff and a lot of respect to you for doing that for the world and also becoming a business transformation leader. So, Marcus, your audience, and we can't wait to hear from you. Great. Well, thank you very much. Let me just share my screen and then we can jump on in. So, A, firstly, thank you, Nana, for inviting me along to Agile in Africa. It's a great honor. It's wonderful to be able to work with you and also to share some of our common passion, I think, which will transpire today. So cheers to that, sir. So what I'm going to talk about today is something different. It's going to be thinking different about agility, the key thing that we're all focused on in the world of agile. So you've had my background, kind of a checkered past, uh, 20 plus years in the military, lots of good fun there, concepts of red teaming sort of unearthed through wargaming and challenge then. Went to government. We've all seen the state of government in recent weeks. I've had the fun of that in the past. And then, as mentioned, I got into financial services, starting sort of agile small pockets, and then eventually became the head of agile at Lloyd's Banking Group and rolled out a, a program called Optimus there that is still now in place four years later. And then went on to other banks, oil and gas. And then I met the author of the book, Red Teaming, Bryce Hoffman, about four years ago. And we partnered up about three years ago and formed what's now Red Team Thinking. Uh, it's quite an agnostic capability because it's all about people. That's just a few of the clients we work with. You can see a real diverse mix because I've not been in an organization yet where people aren't the focus or aren't the centerpiece, but should be more the focus. And that's what our real raison d'etre is about, making a difference to the people in organizations so they can make a difference. More of that later. But I want to kick off with a scale of the challenge. We talked about the complexity today. Great quote here. It's moving too fast. It is revolution, not evolution. There are many accelerations at once. And one of the biggest problems is the difficulty of mankind to cope with it. I don't know whether political leaders or business leaders can easily handle it. Well, I think we do know. Facts are political leaders, business leaders cannot handle the pace of change we're facing today. This quote was over four and a half years ago by Ian Conn. Centrica is British gas utilities. A year later, he stood down as CEO, having lost one billion in profit. So this is almost a premonition of the future back in 2018 because the complexity of the world we're facing is now the reality. It's the new normal. And if you've not heard of it, another military term is something called VUCA. It stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And now this came out of the 1980s war college in America to define the difference in the battlefields between the threat against Russia moving into the terrorist states that we saw in Iraq and Afghanistan. But this is now the reality. This is our new norm. Add to this now H for hyperconnectivity. And what we're seeing now is a world where incidents, where tweets, where a speech are triggering events on the other side of the globe. And we're all now suffering personally in our families, in our homes, given the events that have gone on in Russia and elsewhere. So the question is, are we ready to deal with this new landscape? 
Don't worry. Of course we are. We've got new ways of working. Agile is here to save us all. That's been the promise for the last 20 years. It's what the big consultancies sell to us all. But is it true? It's a quick question for you all. Type your answer in chat. Don't hit send yet. What is the number one challenge to enabling business agility in organizations? Do you think it is number one, skills and capability? Number two, leadership. Number three, funding. Number four, technology. Or number five, the methodologies. So write your answer in chat and then hit send on three, two, one. Fire away. Leadership, leadership, leadership. Common thread, leadership. You won't be surprised the business agility report. I know you and Labour and the CEO of the organization very well. And funny old thing, 2019, leadership number one. The year before that, leadership number one. 2020, in May 2020, I gave a similar presentation to an organization then, and I said, I will bet you a night out in London, all drinks on me, if it's not leadership. I won the bet, it was leadership again. Last year, or this year, 2021, it was in second place. Number one was change fatigue purely because of what was going on with COVID. I bet you again that this year for 2022, leadership's back in the pole position. And why is that? Okay, these poor fellas and ladies at the top, mostly fellas, mostly what I call spoms, stale, pale, old males, running the boardrooms, living in the last century. This is institutionalized command and control culture highlighted there. Now they want to change, but they can't because they have to unlearn a lot of the old things they learned. So question is, can you teach an old dog new tricks? Well, you can. There's my dog. We took him out skateboarding to prove the point. But it's hard, isn't it? Because there's this command and control culture. And the problem with command and control is in the Air Force, I was a command and control officer. I love command and control. I don't think I'm some Stasi dominant, right? People don't understand it. The and is a rubber band. You have command and control, and the key is to be able to push control down through the organization to allow people to make the decisions, to iterate and take responsibility further away from the top. But it's hard to do when you've got old school behaviors. This mentality we see, that creates fear in organizations. The number one response to this problem is fear, a culture of fear. There's a lack of trust. The executives don't trust their workforce to give them the reins to do this. And therefore, there's an inability to do what in the military we call mission command, to delegate that responsibility down to the next level. You rarely see a general on the battlefield it's because he's delegated capability down to the lowest level corporal on the field with a weapon who's closest to the information. He can make the decision quicker. Add to this, this ridiculous obsession with speed. Everybody's busy, double busy some people. Hey, how are you doing? Oh, I'm busy, so busy. It's like a badge of honor. It's a badge of embarrassment where I come from. Seriously, slow down. Right, You have to be like Wyatt Earp here. In a gunfight, you need to take your time, but in a hurry. My mantra is slow down to speed up. Stop rushing around with your ass on fire because you won't see the threats coming in inbound. You're going to get hit by a wrecking ball that you didn't see coming because you weren't looking. You were heads down going too fast. So take the time, slow down. We'll talk about how you do that. And you will accelerate and maintain your sustained pace. You won't get derailed. And it's not hard to see again why these people at the top are confused. This is the roadmap. One good thing that Deloitte has done. But look at the bottom left corner. This is six years old. And I'm sure there's another hundred dots added to this of the overwhelming complex marketplace selling agile. Right. And what you don't see anywhere on there is this concept of red teaming, this challenge. Design thinking is about the closest you get. And look at the paltry thing in the top right corner, management. Where's the leadership getting support here? Poxy five or six yellow dots for the poor managers, right? We're missing the point here. And then what we also do is we bolt the word agile onto anything and it makes it agile, doesn't it? We know this, the agile mindset. What the hell is that? Made up phrase, okay? What that ultimately means is, hey, everyone go and do scrum. We're hashtag totes agile now. And we're seeing what's happening there. And here's the problem. These new ways of working don't work. And it's not the fault of the ways of working. We've evolved from the 20th century to today, the high level technology capabilities that we have and the processes, right? And we forgot the people. When I was a young, a young junior project manager, we used to do people process technology. 
For some reason, that's flipped, and we now do technology process near yeah, people, maybe. You've lost the lead singer of the band, and you've now got a duo of technology and process causing mayhem because the people aren't engaging. We've got all these different tools. You can see them there. And how do we do this? How do we become agile as an organization? We just mass adopt at the coalface. Well, that's not touching probably 90% of the organization. And then we think we scale it by bringing that capability upwards. You don't scale agile, right? You have to enable business agility. And they are two very different things. And when I talk to people and say, can you explain the difference between agile and business agility? And 90% of the time you get, well, aren't they the same thing? No, they're not. And then what happens? 20 years in the running, we are still at 70 to 75% failure rate of agile slash digital transformations. Go figure. 1.4 trillion in the US alone has been wasted on this. Somebody's making a lot of money and somebody's losing a lot of money. Go figure. So let's be clear. Let's not fall for this snake oil. Agile, as great as it is, is not the silver bullet. It's one element of capability that is being misapplied. Add to that this concern that we've seen with leadership and broken trust. Yeah, Steve Jobs had that great quote of, you know, we employ smart people so they can tell us what to do, not the other way around. Don't hire great people and then mandate how they operate, what they do. Tell them how to do things. They'll leave and go elsewhere where they can have that freedom. So put simply, one of my quotes is 21st century ways of working do not work with 20th century ways of thinking. That's the problem. The ways of working are great if you apply them with the right mindset then they will work. If you apply them with the 1990s business school mindset, they will fail. There's the problem. So we need a new way of thinking. And as Einstein said here, we need the ability to question everything. And in a complex world where things are moving at the speed we see them today and the ambiguity is there, we need to be clear on what's going on. And we get clarity by asking better questions, not providing answers and solutions. Can you hear that? No, we can't hear the sound, unfortunately, Marcus. Okay, stand by. Thank you. Let me reshare with share sound. We agreed they didn't pose a threat. Well, in the third you hear that again? refused to believe they could be sent to concentration yes. camps. In 72, we refused to fathom we'd be massacred in the Olympics. In the month before October 1973, we saw Arab troop movements and we unanimously agreed they didn't pose a threat. Well, a month later, the Arab attack almost drove us into the sea. So we decided to make a change. A change? The 10th man. If nine of us look at the same information and arrive at the exact same conclusion, it's the duty of the 10th man to disagree. No matter how improbable it may seem, the tenth man has to start digging with the assumption that the other nine are wrong. And you were the tenth man. Precisely. Great clip there from the movie World War Z, World War Z, what's called the Thinking Man zombie movie. And that concept there, the tenth man, is where the individual there who was the 10th man of Mossad intelligence was saying that if everyone in the room is thinking about the same thing and focusing on the same answer, somebody has to challenge and go, hang on a minute, why are we all going that way? Our brains are very easily seduced. We quickly solutionize, we satisfy us and go with the first answer. And therefore it's imperative that somebody challenges. And from that formed what's called the devil's advocate red team in the Israeli military. You see that in the top right corner, post the Yom Kippur war failings, they stood at this capability that is there to challenge everything that is going on in defense, in military and government. We've got the former commander of that team working for us now. They were called Ipchimistabra, which in Aramaic, it means on the contrary, the opposite may be true. So it's that concept of challenging. And this, this picture here just shows you a an array of where this thing comes from. Red teaming hasn't been made up consultancy style to sell with the latest snake oil starts two and a half thousand years ago with the granddaddy of critical thinking, Socrates in the top left corner, the wisest man in Athens. Why was that? Because he said, I alone know that I know nothing. I have no answers. All I do is question. 
And because he challenged the state for the Athenian people, they didn't like that. And he was put to death. So we can see that the culture of fear of speaking up stems from the origins related through Plato and Aristotle about the behaviors of Socrates. He died for his beliefs. And from that came the method of Socratic questioning. Question things rather than provide answers. The chap with the nose bigger than me, next picture, Pope Sixtus V, coolest name Pope in history. He was looking outside the Vatican one day and saw the queue around the square of people coming to get canonized, to be awarded sainthood. Because again, the Catholic Church was giving out cash to anybody who came and proved their worldly capabilities of miracle making, and they got money for that and became sainted. He said, hang on, hang on a minute. This isn't right. These jokers are just coming to get the cash. So he stood at the office of the Advocatus Diaboli, office of the devil's advocate. That's where the devil's advocate came from, taught in the business schools of the 80s. First mechanism of challenge. We then saw the Prussians being beaten by Napoleon. What you see there is a scaled down battlefield on that table. And this is where the word Kriegspiel came from for war gaming. So they brought their best people around the table. They're not all the generals there. They brought the best officers of cavalry, of artillery, of bombardiers, and said, if we do this, what will Napoleon do? And the Prussians at the time wore uniforms in Prussian blue. Napoleon wore red. So if this was color, sadly, there were no cameras around at that time available. You'd see little red pieces for Napoleon, little blue pieces for the Prussians. Hence, the word red teaming first originated. And then post 9-11, the day after, George Tenet, the then director of the CIA, stood at the Red Cell. The US Army stood at the Red Teaming University. And if you look on the CIA website, since then they've said that they've saved over 50% of events similar to 9-11 from happening again by contrast of the Red Cell's capability and challenge. So that's where Red Teaming originates. Again, my partner, Bryce Hoffman, went through, he's a former journalist, he went through the course itself at the university, wrote the book Red Teaming, and then since then, we've been porting this capability into business because it works. It's essential. And we've evolved that to red team thinking. And I did a, a brief earlier this week on Risk Awareness Week about the lost art of contradiction. Great words and phrases out there. One of them at the moment is psychological safety. It comes from the work of Professor Amy Edmondson from Harvard University, wrote a great book called The Fearless Organization. And there's a lack of psychological safety. They talked about fear, cultures of fear where people don't speak up. So if we don't have that, how can we manage and avoid these risks that are out there if either we don't speak up or if we do, we're ignored, right? So this ability for us to challenge, to dissent, to be contrarian, these are all seen as bad things at the moment. They're not. They're essential. And if you're, if you're a C-suite member and you're not allowing and enabling your people to challenge you, you are a fool and you're a dead man walking. Your business will go off a cliff and you won't even see it coming because we've got this world of faux harmony. We all have to be nice to each other. We can't, we can't challenge because we might get offended. We're fearful of speaking up and we've got too many fragile egos that get shattered by one question, okay? And that quote's from me, so you can have that one for free. I don't like to have people silenced. My role, our job at Red Team Thinking is to enable people to speak up and do it in a safe way. And this comes from Tim Berners-Lee. If you don't know who Tim Berners-Lee is, he's a creator and inventor of the World Wide Web. We need diversity of thought in the world. All these BS diversity programs that are going to organizations to get 20% of these, 15% of those, tick box agendas, you're missing the key piece, inclusion. We work with many clients. We had one individual came to me and said, Marcus, diversity without inclusion is delusion. The whole premise of diversity is to get diversity of thought. A diverse workforce that is not enabled to speak up brings no diversity of thought. It ticks your boxes. You do not need that to survive today. You need to enable and include the people you hire to tick your diverse boxes and get more. So how does this work? Red team thinking. The evolution of red teaming and key hits a cognitive capability as well as a practical. This is about retraining your brain because it needs to be retrained, believe me. And it allows these things to happen. It engages critical thinking. Now, you all may think you're critical thinkers. You all may think you think logically. You don't. Your brain is lazy, overdrives what you're trying to do, and you have to physically engage critical thinking. More of that in a moment. It exposes threats and identifies opportunities. The threats facing the Israelis were ignored. They were blind to them. They didn't see the opportunities they could take in the situation, 
And so many organizations are often heads down looking at threats that they also miss opportunities and they don't see what's called the unknown unknowns. There are very few unknown unknowns, these black swans. There's no such thing as a black swan. It's a made up term by Nico Taleb and even he now regrets saying it because it makes people lazy. They get dismissed. Oh, it's a black swan. I can never see that coming. You didn't look, you didn't think. It enables what I talked about earlier, delegating that decision-making, distributing it across the organization to where the information's at and the decisions can be made the quickest. And it encourages diversity of thought, without a doubt. So how does it do this? Well, as I said, it's a mindset shift first because it's cognitive. Probably ultimately what a, an agile mindset was trying to be. And it's a set of tools, simple, effective, quick to use, easy to apply, instantly effective tools. And if you do that, it allows you to navigate complexity, to steer your way through this myriad of ambiguity, of complexity that we're facing into. It allows you to think more strategically. That's not the job of the C-suite. That's the job of everybody. Interns should be thinking strategically. Actions I do today, what's the strategic impact they're having downrange? If everything you're doing isn't linked to strategic objectives of your business, of your organization, of your life, why are you doing it? If you don't know, stop and ask. Allows you to develop new ideas. We talk about innovation. Companies have innovation labs. If you've got an innovation lab, you've failed already. Your company is the innovation lab. Your people are the innovators. Are you enabling them to get those ideas and perspectives surfaced, or is it an echo chamber? Talk about agility. Agility is an awful word, it's been misused and abused and misunderstood. We're talking here about adaptivity and resilience. You get punched in the face, you go down, you get back up. Next time you see the punch coming, you're adapting and you duck out the way. You are able to keep going and over and over these constant hurdles that come at your way. And if you get taken down, you get back up. And ultimately, it's allowing you to make better decisions faster. This is the key. We see many, so many decisions made poorly or slowly or never. Making better ones quicker is the key. Going back to that slow down to speed up. So you've got an option, really. You can keep taking the blue pull. And I'm not talking about Viagra for a fun night out. We're talking about ignorance, which is not bliss. If you want to remain ignorant, carry on. However, I know Nana's got a bag of these and so do I. If you want to take the red pill, start exposing these issues, open the closet, invite the skeletons to come out, lift up the rug, find everything you've been hiding, what we call the lies we tell ourselves, and take the red pill, come on down the rabbit hole and let's see what's down there because that's how you make a difference. So. First off, I'm going to teach you a simple tool you can use and take away for free today. Fundamental foundational tool, think, write, share. I call this now face palm coaching because this is so ridiculously straightforward. People go, are we paying you for this? Yes, you are because you don't do it. Common sense is not common. So here we go. Think about the question. If I walk in a room or Nana walks in a room and go, hey, guys, here's my question. Somebody will spring butt out and shout the answer out. Or I'll go as the boss. Okay. Uh, it, Here's the question. What I'm thinking is this. This is a solution. I've now led everybody to think about the solution that I'm thinking about. I'm not getting the freedom of thought. So I say, right, stop. Don't speak. Here's the question. Think. And literally take a moment of mindfulness. Take 60 seconds. Set the clock. Think about the question. Engage your brain for critical thinking. And the difference is if you think of an answer straight away, 80% of the time, by the time you second out, you will have thought of a different answer because you'll be cognitively engaging. Now, write that answer down. This is a twofer. What you're doing now is committing to the answer and in doing so by writing it, Dr. Gary Klein, who we work with, done lots of work on this. It triggers neurons that do more thinking differently than if you're just thinking. That by writing, you're becoming more concise and you're constraining your thoughts to a physical outcome. So you've written it down. Now, you know, also, you can now listen. So when you share your answer, remember in school, when the teacher goes, I've got a question, and Nana puts his hand up. And while Nana's answering, I'm not listening to Nana. I'm thinking of what my answer is, because she's going to ask me next if he gets it wrong. Because you've written it down, you can now give full attention to what Nana's saying and your other colleagues. So you're now actively listening. So we're now partaking. And then we share that. Everybody's now engaged. If I've got 10 people in a room, I get 10 answers. There may be some similarities. Everyone's engaged. Everyone feels bought in. We then look at hybrid solutions. We look at the golden answer that Bob, who never speaks, came up with. 
we put them all together and we get the best solution. And even if my solution is dismissed, I don't care. It's considered and I'm engaged and I've contributed to the other part. Super simple, use this in meetings, questions, etc. So let's do it. What prevents the best ideas surfacing in your organization? What prevents the best ideas surfacing in your organization? Take a minute to think about that. 30 seconds, I'll put some pressure on you. Time's precious. Think about it. When you've had a good think, just write your answer down. And then I want you to write it into Menti. You can QR code scan that. Go to menti.com 34515301. Menti three four five one five three zero one. Let me share my screen for you so you can see what some of the answers are. Marcus, can you pop the code into the chat? Okay, no, you stay. I can see it on the screen. Three four five one five three zero one. Okay, brilliant. And let, let me stick the actual direct link in. So again, the beauty of Think Right Share. The way you can do this, you can got electronic capabilities, Menti Mural in a room if you want anonymity. We have anonymity for two reasons, prevents bias and allows everyone to speak up without fear. It creates instant psychological safety. So don't tell me, like Lencioni says, five dysfunctions, you need trust before you can have conflict. Nonsense. Create conflict will build trust. And you can create conflict by having fake, if you will, manufactured psychological safety. Everybody now feels safe speaking up. I don't know who's written these things. If you do this in a room, give everyone a post-it or a card and the same pen, write it all down in capitals, bring them all in, stick them on a wall. Nobody knows who's written what. And then you have an open discussion led. You can speak up on points. People are engaging. And the more you do this, the quicker you do this, people will build that trust and then you won't need these anonymized capabilities. People will be happy to speak up. Powerful stuff. Fear of being wrong. So again, personal. I don't want to be seen to be wrong. The culture doesn't allow it. Control of above. Assumptions. Leadership and nepotism. Cronyism. Fear. Okay, just a few answers, and you won't be surprised if we do this. 80% of the answers we get are standard across all of those organizations I told you about. Very similar. So take those away and go, right, what can we now do to rectify some of these problems? Pick the main one, what's having the most impact on us. Take that away in your organization and work out what you can do, what procedures or processes you can change or behaviors to stop it happening. So critical thinking, the number one thing we want to engage. Why do we need this? Again, common sense. World Economic Forum report last year, it's the future capability we all need. It is essential. I disagree. It's not 2025. It's now. But it's the most lacking. And the problem is, is it says there, humans think we have 60,000 thoughts a day, but we don't consciously focus on actual critical thinking. We just think we do. It's a trick. So again, you can see here, analysis, problem solving, the most lacking and the most missing. Look at those things on the right. Communication, keys to leadership. Can we deal with complexity and ambiguity? VUCA, no, we can't. These are all skills missing of CVs and resumes in the world today, but they're the most essential. This is what employers are looking for. And here's the problem. As I said, if I asked you all your critical thinkers and rational, you go, yeah, of course we are, Marcus. And I go, no, you're not. Okay, it's dead easy. You're not. Let's just be absolutely clear on the fact you are not critical thinkers. You just assume that you are. And it's fine. This guy, Adam Smith, philosopher, Glasgow Business School named after him, thought we were, had us all convinced that we were, unless we were strayed by strong emotions, love, fear, or we didn't have the information. 
And then this gentleman came along. If you've not heard of him, Dr. Daniel Kahneman, author of Thinking Fast and Slow and Noise. Excellent books. Highly recommend. He says, nonsense, Mr. Smith. Your brain, our brains are machines for jumping to conclusions. They are fickle. They will jump around like a pinball machine, depending on the input they're getting from the outside world. Nana says something, I swing towards that and I'm swayed. But then I see something on my social media feed, I sway back to that. I hear Susie talking at the cooler and I'm changing to what Susie's talking about. My brain bounces around and it's lazy and goes with whatever's being fed. And he calls this system one thinking. Your default setting of your brain is to use intuition and react instinctively. What he also talks about, though, is the important thing is system two thinking. This is the engagement of the brain. And the difference here, see on the left, system one is fast, automatic, error prone, though. That's the key. But it's our default state. This is how we were born. The, the brain is the least evolved organ muscle capability of the human being since its invention. Because it was to keep us alive back in the plains of Africa, hunting out for our daily food. If a lion comes along, system one kicks in we dock out the way. A car comes around the corner. We haven't seen it. Last minute, we dive out the way. That's instant system one kicking in. But it's error prone. And in a complex VUCA world, you can't afford to be system one. If you know about Kinefin, Dave Snowden talks about complexity. We have to probe, sense, respond. We have to experiment. We have to create hypotheses. Sounds a bit agile style stuff. Yeah, that's what it's all about. Iterative thinking, pausing, system two engagement. It's rational and it's more reliable. Okay, so let's have a, a simple maths question. Here we can all play along. This beautiful bat and ball here made of willow costs one pound 10 together. The bat costs one pound more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Super quick. Okay. Super quick. You can go back to Menti again. The link's in chat. How much does the ball cost? Nana scratching his head. Okay, let's share the mentee results and see what's what. So we have unknown. There's not enough information there, somebody says. Two people have said 10 cents. Okay, 10, 10, unknown, you may be thinking 10, say 10 if you need to do, it's all good, we've got 10 as well in the uh, chat room. You know when I said quite arrogantly, I'm guessing, and abruptly that you're all rational, logical thinkers, and I said you're not, you know, I was right, the ball's 5p, it's not 10p, you all got that wrong, and this is simple maths, okay? And that doesn't mean you can't do basic school maths. It doesn't mean you're stupid. What it means is, right, and by the way, 50% of people from Harvard get this wrong and 80% university students get this wrong. It means your brain kicked in. You thought the answer was 10 because that looks the apparent answer. So your brain is lazy and takes a shortcut and pulls you down the quickest, most apparent answer. It was wrong. If you'd have stopped, if I'd have given you think, right, share, and said, take 60 seconds, you would have got that right. Nine out of 10 times people get it right with 60, with 60 seconds on the clock. Nine out of 10 times they get it wrong when we use your brain, because this is what happens. Your brain seduces you. Be aware. And it's not just because you can't do maths. It's not just because your brain's tricking you. We're all affected by this dizzying array of biases and heuristics. Heuristics are mental shortcuts that we've learned. There are hundreds of these groups down into about 10 different groups and everybody's affected by them, okay? They're unavoidable. If you don't think you're affected by biases, then go and apply for the for a role in the World War Z 2 movie because you are a zombie. There's nothing between your ears. If you have a brain, you are affected by biases. It's part of being human. We can't get rid of it. But what we have to do is recognize when we're being impacted by them. We have to recognize them in others and then understand how to address them. So if you're dealing with somebody who you know the biases that are impacting how they're behaving, it allows you to approach the subject in a different way. So what do you get with red team thinking? You get lots, you get whole toolkit capabilities and a mindset shift for behavioral change, but really we're focusing on these three things. Again, face palm coaching coming up, I make no apologies, this is simple. You get clarity. 
Have you got clarity of your vision, mission, purpose, and direction in your organization? And then do you have clarity of what is it is you're supposed to be doing, the problems you're facing? Do you have situational awareness, self-awareness, and awareness of those around us? I've yet to speak to any organization where they answer yes to all of those. And if you do have all that, do you then have the capability, both the technical and professional competence to do what's needed, but also the cognitive capability to do what's needed in a complex world? Again, no is the usual answer. And if you've got two no's there, then there's no way you're going to have a culture that fosters innovation, learning and development, challenge and critical thinking. You're normally going to have a toxic culture of fear, and therefore you get this vicious circle rather than a spiraling upwards capability of upskilling your organization by learning, evolving, Kaizen, continuous improvement. Again, super simple three C's. So ultimately, what we want to do is enable the art of contradiction. We want you to do all of these things. Take away the build. So if I said, hey, this guy, Nana, who works for me, he disagrees, he's a contrarian, he's provocative, he criticizes and he disrupts. That doesn't sound like a good guy. That doesn't sound like someone you want working for you. But if you agree in a disagree in an agreeable way, if you are collegiate when you're contrarian, if I'm professionally provocative and I'm constructive in my criticism and I deliberately disrupt, that is a good thing and you need this. Because if you don't do this, this will happen from the external influences we have. This is why I talk about the lost art of contradiction. These things have gone from people's capabilities. We help people reinstall this into themselves and their organizations. A couple of uh, examples here. Everyone gets heard. We did this with a group in NATO. We had a young female intern, 20 years old, in a room full of gnarly warfighters. 50-year-old colonels with scars all the way down through the ranks of this young lady. She was dropping bombs by day two. Absolute stunning input to the problems they were trying to solve. By the end of the week, they had 10 recommendations to the admiral. And the colonel, giving me his dues, stood up and said, sir, if it hadn't been for this lady at the back of the room, we wouldn't have had five of these. And the admiral turned around and said, stand up. Is it, how come this happened? And she said, sir, if it wasn't for these tools this week, I wouldn't have spoken up. Powerful stuff. So you're losing out on that capability if you don't enable. Great quote from Branson here. Use your brain power. We don't. We're lazy. Critical thinking is the key. If you enable critical thinking, everybody in your organization is thinking. Be like this cute kid on the right here. And a wonderful individual, Christian Johansson, check out our podcast. He's on there telling you all about this. He did this, put himself through the course, put his exec through the course, created a trainer-trainer program in his organization. This isn't just a power tool for making better decisions. It allowed him to shift the culture of the organization in the direction it needed to go. That is a powerful statement and a capability that few have. How do you shift culture? There's no wheels on it. There's no handles. You do it through changing behaviors, which changes perspective and mindset, which shifts culture, and it's virtuous. It keeps going up and around in the right direction. And again, Daniel Kahneman. Great podcast I'll share with Nana afterwards to distribute. You need to protect your dissenters. I'll build on this. You need to protect them. You need to encourage them and you need to multiply them. If you've got an organization full of dissenters who are taught well and understand the art of contradiction, you have a powerhouse. You have superheroes unleashed within your organization. Don't bring consultancies in. You don't need to pay someone to think for you. Don't outsource thinking. Use the people within because they've got the answers, believe me. So how do you do this? As I said, we don't need trust first. We build trust by enabling conflict. And as I've said, the Red Team Thinking Toolkit is like a Swiss Army knife. Lots of different tools and techniques that you can use. Muscle memory almost. Impact is quick. It's effective. You add it on. It's complementary. It's not here to replace Agile. It makes Agile work. I wish I'd had these tools when I was the uh, head of Agile at Lloyd's. It would have been far more easier and effective to get things done. And someone said it's like an 80s martini. Anytime, any place, anywhere, but also anyone for any problem. So how can we make behavioral change today? Real easy. Your meetings from tomorrow. Use this great cardinal rule. Everybody speaks once before anyone speaks twice. Make it leaders speak last. Do that straight away. For confidence building, use think, write, share. Anonymity. Everyone gets heard. Everyone engages. And then use anonymous voting. When you do get all those different proposals, dot vote. Get people to vote anonymously so you can pick the main things that are focusing for the concerns of the group. Easy ways to change behavior. 
do this, you'll start to get cultural shift very quickly. And in doing so, we're going to eradicate groupthink. Great quote from Patton here, World War II general. If everybody's thinking alike, somebody isn't thinking. Goes back to the 10th man concept. Challenge people who are in the echo chamber. So be like these little cool kids. Don't outsource thinking. The answers lie within. Thank you. That was Thinking Different About Agility. Open to any questions or if we're out of time, I'm around for later. Feel free to drop me a line. Check out the podcast, The Thinking Leader. Lots of great people on there. Dave Snowden, Gary Klein, Alan Mullally, uh, David Marquet of Submarine fame recently. So some great conversations worth listening to. Nah, nah. Over to you, sir. Thank you. In Commander Marcos Dimbleby, retired. What can I say? <laughs> nah, nah, yeah. Over to you. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me sound old. No, I mean, it's like you retired early. Like I did. me. Yeah, you retired go. early. You know, you retired early because I got out, I don't know, was it brigadier or what? Or what, I can't even remember, or commissioner. Uh, we all retired early. So, you know, I got this. But if I take this off, I look really young. So I put this on <laughs> to deceive people that I'm actually older than my age. Yeah, I, I've know? got my two little grey spots there. Not, I know. I'm not I quite catching that. you up yet. I can, I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, yeah, over to you. <laughs> Red team thinking, blue pill, red pill. Red Thank pill. you very much, Marcus. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, Brilliant. A lot of insights in there. Um, awesome. So please, if you have any question, comments, please put in the chats or you can put it in the Q&A and Marcus can respond to it. Indeed. I'll stick around. Look forward to the next yeah, presentation. Good, I'll answer good, any questions. Good feedback from people. Thanks, Marcus. Different perspective. Um, kind of presentation be shared. Yes, definitely the presentation will be shared later. Um, great, a lot of um, positive feedback for you, Marcus. Um, please, if you. you have any question, you can put it in. Um, so we don't have any open questions yet. I think I think I think Robin wants to say something about Marcus. A, a yes. message. Okay. I only have one word to say about Marcus. Wow. <laughs> and Thank you, Robin. Uh, well, you know, the super interesting thing about, uh, and then I was into this cosmic alignment. So yesterday I spoke with my colleague um, and I said to him, have you booked that red team course for us in December? And he said, no, not yet. I now understand why he hadn't. I wanted to see no, that. Tell us, tell us, tell us. Well, I I got an email and I can make my own application directly now, can't I? Perfect. Look forward to seeing you. <laughs> Marcus, I told Robin about Red Team Thinking and I said to him like a what? Three, four weeks ago, Robin, yourself and Valente. Valente Jones is coming on later and he's an ex-Navy. Uh, uh, he's ex-Navy from the US Navy. And I said, to, I said to them on a platform, we're on a platform together and I said to them, I said, guys, Agile, yeah, 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 yeah. You know me and Agile. I've been talking about agility, not Agile, <laughs> you know. I said, guys, I'm done with Agile. I'm into, like, honestly, this is like, you. I've been talking about Red Pill. I've been talk I've been, I've been Morpheus for so many years. I've been talking oh, about Red Pill. Oh, you are, mate. You've got the look. And, yeah. <laughs> I, I just, I get, well, where's my dark glasses? Okay. I've, I, I have a small <laughs> one. I, I've got this. I got this tiny one, like the like Morpheus, right? I've been talking about this stuff, right? Yeah, and when I met Marcus, yeah, I just said to myself, you know what? This is it. This this is it, Robin. And I told you, Robin, what was the message I sent you? I said you've got to do this. I didn't say think about it. I said you've got to do this. This is it. <laughs> Recognize that command control, Marcus. <laughs> oh, don't I just, my lord? I lived with it for so long and just rebelled against it and. You know, it's one of those things I've been quite fortunate. I've been, you know, I've been that contrarian, I've been that maverick, and I've either been fired, demoted, embarrassed, or I've been promoted, awarded, given medals. You know, it all depends on the context, depends who you're going up against. Yeah. But it's one of those things to me is where end of the night, I go to bed, I look in the mirror, and I know my rule number one is I've done the right thing that day. And, you know, it's this moral compass we talk about that is so lost for many. 
and people are forced into, and it's not often their fault, the context of their situation, their life, they are put into positions where they have to be quiet and become sheep-like. And that leads to mediocrity. And this is why we see organizations struggling. So it's a it's a tough one, but th- this is certainly a capability that we know. We've got lots of case studies. I can talk to people about this where we've seen this really effectively work. It just re-engages people. And that's what's lacking. And, uh, I, you know, I've um, worked on many a failed um, agile transformation. Um, and yes, it's pretty much always the same. Every once in a while, you get one that just, works like a dream but it's it's a bit like um it's a bit like a diamond in the rough isn't it it is uh, absolutely so yeah that was that was really inspirational and um you know the synchronicity of the universe uh, has definitely uh, aligned so yeah you'll definitely hear it from me everything happens for a reason we believe in it